finishing his PhD at Cornell. His research interests include spaceflow dynamics, control, and technologies. Thanks for the introduction. What I want to talk about is an algorithm that I've developed and implemented in simulation for reconfiguration of multi-body spacecraft. So let me make clear from the outset that by uh, multi-body spacecraft, as I'm trying to suggest with my title slide here, I'm talking about modular spacecraft where each module is housed in its own vehicle. And by configuration, I mean a set of positions and attitudes for all those modules. So I'm differentiating this from formations in that, that I generally make the assumption that these modules are connected somehow. Uh, but th there's possible ap applications beyond that. By reconfiguration, I mean going from one system layout to another, possibly changing the functionality of the spacecraft. So, let me talk about why you might want to do this. Well, this reconfiguration problem is related to a lot of different challenges that uh, we face when we're trying to put together spacecraft and space missions. It's related to assembly, it's re related to deployment, repair, uh, adaptation of spacecraft to changing mission roles in a sort of operationally responsive space kind of sense. Uh, as this little uh, cartoon here is supposed to suggest, you can relate each uh, piece of this to reconfiguration. Say you have a modular spacecraft with a broken module, and you might want to eject that module, replace it with a new one, and then perhaps at some time later, or you want to change the layout of the spacecraft to change its functionality at a system level. Here's a familiar reconfigurable system, the International Space Station. You're probably all familiar with its assembly process as it gains new modules, it gains new functionality. But during that assembly, there are also instances where the position of modules are changed from one part of the station to another. So you might move an airlock from over here to over here it, as you add modules onto one side of the space station. And that changes the way the astronauts interact with it, maybe changes other capabilities that the space station has. So not only assembly, but also moving the modules around. And what I want to do is look for opportunities to take advantage of passive physics to reconfigure space systems. And I want to take advantage of ways that we might be able to define the physics, to enforce things like collision avoidance as we move modules around. So to do this, we proposed uh, in a conference paper last year and elaborated on now a kinematic control concept. So let me uh, talk about first the, the sort of way that we typically think about reconfiguring space systems. Suppose you have a, a system composed of modules and these vehicles are docked together in some way and you want to get them into this configuration. Well, the sort of obvious and straightforward way to do that is to have them all undock from one another, let go, and then you solve some kind of multi-body uh, tracking problem and you do some collision avoidance and try to get to the final state through some maneuvers and then you have them all capture each other again in the end state. And I contend that this has some disadvantages in that uh, we have a lot of real-time computation requirements for multi-body control, path planning, obstacle avoidance, things like that. Uh, it has low robustness to controller communication failures. I, I saw a, a pretty good, um, uh, there's been a lot of work done uh, on the MIT Spheres project for, for this sort of maneuver, and uh, typically they end up communicating in spacecraft states between spacecraft. So if that link doesn't work, you might have collisions. Uh, and you may be expending a lot of propellant and, and uh, power to get these spacecraft to maneuver. So the concept that uh, we proposed last year is that what if instead we take this system and we constrain the bodies, we allow them to evolve, and then we constrain them again in the final configuration once that dynamic evolution is complete. And then if that, uh, perhaps we didn't get all the way to our final configuration, we repeat the constraining and evolving until we get where we want to go. So here's how the algorithm works. Let's represent a multi-body space system as a point in a configuration space. So this bottom plane here represents a two-dimensional configuration space where every point is a set of relative positions and orientations of all the bodies. And uh, if our system has some kinematics to it, some joints and hinges and uh, things like that, then it can only move along a manifold in that configuration space, in this case a line that might not be aligned with any particular direction, but we know that the spacecraft has to slide along this line. Along that line, for every configuration, the spacecraft has some potential energy uh, because of, of any forces acting on the spacecraft. 
And we know that uh, since I'm a, a physics major from Williams, you know, I like to think about potential energies and potential wells. So we know that the spacecraft is going to slide down to this potential well. In the presence of dissipation, it'll end up at this point. And there, maybe we have some options with our space system to set some new kinematics, some new line in configuration space. That line has some other potential energy that, we, that uh, the spacecraft experiences. And again, it slides down to the minimum. So what we see is if I uh, change the vertical axis from potential energy to time here, when the spacecraft is constrained to move along this line in configuration space, we get some nice damped passive settling out behavior to this point in configuration space. Then we change the kinematics and we get again some nice response to some other equilibrium point. What we also get out of this is a graph structure of uh, what I call a reconfiguration graph of the system. So each of these points where we have some dynamic equilibrium is a, a point configuration space the spacecraft can get to. And each of these, these uh, sets of kinematics and the potential energy that causes these transitions is an, an edge on the graph, a connection between nodes that tells us we go from one to the other and then from this one to the third one. And then from there the question is can we explore this graph? We do it through simulation to try to identify what other configurations we can get to. Are there any ways to loop back to previous configurations to change the potential energy in some way so that we can have systems that don't just go one way, but we can pick any of its possible configurations and get to them. Now, I've been talking about potential energies and forces driving this uh, reconfiguration maneuver. And uh, so here's an idea of where I think these forces might come from. You can generate them on the spacecraft. You could have attitude actuators, joint actuators in, uh, in each body of the spacecraft or in the, the joints themselves. Uh, I like to think about potential energies, so onboard magnetic fields are a nice way to get uh, to express things in a, a sort of potential energy sort of way. But also there are ambient forces in the space environment, things like gravity gradient or atmospheric drag or solar pressure that could put some force on the spacecraft and drive these reconfigurations without any power expenditure on the spacecraft itself. All we do is set the kinematics and let it go. And then when it gets to its new equilibrium point, we set the kinematics to something else and let it go again. Now there's an enabling technology here that I want to talk about for a, a brief moment. Those of you who have seen me present at other conferences have seen this before. Uh, this is magnetic flux pinning. This is an interaction between magnets, permanent magnets, or any other magnetic field, and a type 2 superconductor, where the magnetic fields get embedded on impurities in the superconductor's crystal structure. You can see in the movie that I'm demonstrating that this is pinned in 5 out of 6 degrees of freedom. So it's okay to rotate around this uh, axis because the magnetic field is symmetric about that axis. There's sort of nothing for the superconductor to grab onto. So this is, this is one way to make a, a hinge, a joint in space out of components that are connected. Now if we can change the magnetic field, which we might do by substituting a new magnet or energizing a coil or something like that, maybe even moving magnets to a field that is asymmetric, then we have stiffness in all those previous degrees of freedom, but uh, my big fat crowd little figure will demonstrate now, we also have some stiffness in this rotation direction. So now we've gone from 5 doff pinning to 6 doff pinning because this magnetic field is asymmetric. This also fits in well with thinking about uh, potential energies because this is a nice stable potential well. Here's the potential energy of a magnet translating uh, perpendicular to a superconductor face represented by this plane here. So it's got this nice potential well that's actually offset from the superconductor. So it lets us attract things without having them slam together. So in order to do this, uh, this ex exploration of a reconfiguration graph and determine what configurations a spacecraft can get to using these methods, we needed some simulation tools. And uh, with our limited assortment of university licenses and our desire to play with kinematics directly and get out of states, uh, I decided to write one myself. So uh, we've developed a multi-body dynamics toolbox that works in the MATLAB environment. It's based on the uh, expression of, well, I'll show you the equation in a second. Uh, so if you want to look at constrained motion, so you have some set of bodies and they have constraints between them because of joints. Uh, hinges, prismatic joints, translations, things like that. Um, we know that unconstrained equations of motion are pretty easy, right? F equals ma. Uh, 
for constrained motion, this force splits up into the applied force, and we know there's a component that comes from constraint forces that keeps all those constraints satisfied. Now, maybe we don't solve for that directly, and instead we just impose the constraint as something of, for example, this form, some matrix that depends on your states and velocities times an acceleration vector equals some other matrix. This is the way uh, Udwadia and Kalaba um, in the early 90s, I think, expressed it to develop equations of motion. This is a, a method of developing equations of motion that I hadn't seen until last year, so I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about this to explain what it does. But what's interesting about it is that it explicitly takes into account constraints, and that's what I want to play with. So take unconstrained motion. Represent a system as a point in some state space. So you have some initial state, some initial velocity, you put a force on it, you get an acceleration. Easy. Okay. So now if we have constraints, those A and B matrices, that means that this point has to move along some kind of surface in n-dimensional space, right? In, in, uh, where n is your sort of uh, number of states, right? Um, we know that when we apply the force in this direction, we don't get motion in that direction. We have to slide along the surface. We get something uh, that, that differs. And it differs by, well, this quantity g at least uh, is an expression of that difference, not exactly the difference. And what Udwadia and Kalaba found is that the acceleration that minimizes g, so this is sort of taking the acceleration you would get if there were no constraints and projecting it onto those constraints, is this equation right here. And this is an equation of motion of a constrained system. What's interesting about it is, uh, well, first you can see this uh, more Penrose pseudo inverse, which means it has something to do with minimizing something, right? But what's interesting about it is that the constraint matrices enter explicitly and just as their matrix forms that we saw before. So these are the things I want to monkey around with in my simulation tools. And so this is a very nice way to, to pop out equations of motion for those things. So I also want to keep this general for, uh, for uh, determining configurations without knowing what the final configuration might be. So maybe I would hit some singularity and Euler angles and I don't want that to happen. So we used uh, quaternion states in our simulation tool development. So uh, that, that introduced a little bit of complication because if you take Euler's equation for rigid body dynamics and you put in a simple transformation to quaternion derivatives, so this T matrix is nice and known, uh, stuff that in there and you do get something of this, this form with this sort of F equals MA form, right, an effective force and an effective mass matrix that fits into the udwadia kalaba architecture. However, now we've gone from a 3 by 3 inertia matrix to a 4 by 4 space without really gaining any rank. So this effective mass is actually rank deficient. Fortunately, um, well, this is a problem because we need the inverse of the mass matrix for the equation of motion. But fortunately, Udwadia and one of his later collaborators came up with a version of their equation that works for rank deficient mass matrices. So this is what we implement in MATLAB uh, I've developed an object-oriented implementation. I call it QUIRK. This is my terrible attempt at acronyms. Quaternion-based interface for rigid body kinetics. But it's an object-oriented MATLAB set of codes that let you make bodies and, and solve multi-body equations of motion in the presence of forces and torques and uh, potential energy functions and get out uh, results like system energetics and animations and things. Uh, if you're interested in this, I just put it on our website at spacecraftresearch.com slash flux slash quirk, or you can catch me afterwards. I have it on my laptop here.